All right. It looks like we are right at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us wherever you are in the world today, whether you're working remotely or you're in a hospital or working in a healthcare facility of any kind or in an office. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day to hopefully enjoy a slice of pizza and engage in today's presentation about how the current crisis is affecting employee engagement, particularly in healthcare. My name is Jim Schroeder. I'm the marketing manager here at WorkCrowd, and I'll be helping moderate the session today. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. The duration of the presentation portion of the webinar will be one hour. Um, that includes two great sessions from Zachary Lipner and Dr. Bob Nelson titled, Heroes Work Here, the impact of COVID-19 on employee engagement. And this, these presentations will be followed by an interactive Q&A panel that we will extend up to 30 minutes past the hour, so please stick around as your schedule permits. And to that end, please drop any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation in the chat box, and we'll be sure to address those, as many as we can, during Q&A and follow up afterwards. Um, one other quick housekeeping item, we'll be providing a complimentary copy of 1001 Ways to Engage Employees, Dr. Bob's uh, latest book, to the first 100 attendees to the live session. So stay tuned for more details on that. So as I mentioned, we have these two great speakers lined up for you. So that's enough for me. And I'm going to pass it over to Michael Levy for some brief introductions. Hello, everybody. As Jim said, thanks. Appreciate you all for coming, attending, and your interest. There's certainly a significant population of those attending on the call today, so we both appreciate uh, your interest and enthusiasm, and obviously it's as a result of the quality of the content and the two speakers uh, that I'm happy to connect uh, you with very briefly on sort of who we are, work proud, and why we're doing these educational outreach is we think it is a uh, fundamental responsibility, uh, particularly relevant in this time and age and some of the things we're going through, and that is to make employees feel proud of the work that they do at an individual level, no matter whether you are the uh, physician, anesthetist, the nurse, the administrators, F and B, security, you should feel proud. You should feel that your work contributes to the actual end game. And the end game mission, of course, in healthcare is to uh, extend our lives, improve the quality of our lives. We've been working in this space now for some uh, 18, almost 19 years. We have some 450 programs in operation, significant expertise in how you can realize the benefits of an employee population that is engaged, enthusiastic, and in summary, that when people go to work each day, we want them to feel, again, inspired to give their best. And we think inspiration can come from uh, a source of recognition and a sense of pride in the work one does uh, and, uh, and in the company they work for. And of course, no more so than in healthcare. Uh, it's tough for all of us, no matter what the industry that we happen uh, to be in during these times. Uh, the changes that we've had to all go through personally, professionally, the work from homes, the, uh, you know, the children yelling and screaming while we're worried about their ongoing education. But put it in the context of folks that are in the healthcare frontline delivery service, and we certainly have a lot of respect and appreciation because it's a stressful time anyway. And it's exemplified by the fact that those folks that are in the healthcare space have to actually go then and frontline face and, and battle you know, this challenging virus and these circumstances we face. Anyway, uh, I'm very proud to be able to introduce first Zach Lipner. So Zach, if you want to bring your screen up so they can see you. So Zach and I have had a working relationship for uh, over a decade. He's certainly one of the uh, uh, inspirations for some of the capabilities that we've helped companies uh, deliver. Uh, Zach is the former Chief Human Resource Officer at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center, part of the RWJ Barnabas Hospital System, and he's got a fantastic story to tell you. I will get out of your way, Zach. All the best. Thank you for doing this for us all today. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, it is absolutely good to be here. 
Um, Because there was, I guess, a possibility that I wouldn't have seen July of 2020 um, because I uh, I was uh, sick with with COVID very early on. But let me let me tell you my story here. And if timing is everything, then I blew it big time. After working at Newark Bed Israel Medical Center for 32 years, in February of 2019, I gave our president a year's notice and said, "You need to find another CHRO." And uh, February 14th, 2020 was the date I gave him. Seemed innocuous enough. Um, Valentine's Day, good day to leave an organization I loved. Newark Beth Israel, just for some background, is a quaternary care medical center located in, of all places, Newark, New Jersey. Conveniently located here in Essex County, right about 10 miles from, uh, from Manhattan. Or a major teaching hospital, regional transplant center, or the Children's Hospital of New Jersey. We're a big, busy place with uh, lots of programs going on, been around for over 120 years. Really a great organization and really proud to say that I worked there for those 32 years, although um, my last three months was kind of interesting. Because all I had to do to be able to retire this past February was to recruit a successor as Chief Human Resource Officer. And frankly, we didn't get it done. So I was not surprised in December when our CEO asked me to stay until June 1 until a new CHRO could be on board. Uh, no problem, I told him. Well, let, let me just, you know, put my feet up on the desk and uh, uh, do a victory lap, uh, work three days a week, take it easy for a few months, and continue to draw my salary. Boy, was I wrong. It did not turn out that way. So let me take you to March 15th of 2020. I was the administrator on call that week, as was our custom. Um, You go in and you make rounds during the day, you make rounds in the evening, sort of married to the hospital for the week that you are AOC. So I went in to make rounds in the morning, Uh, usually takes a couple hours and talk to some employees and make sure things are going well operationally. I had no idea what I was going to find when I got there. Um, I got there, I found our command center open. I found a whole group of clinicians very engaged in all sorts of activities, from counting supplies to coordinating care for the COVID patients who are now arriving in our ED. I spent some time talking with our COO, Dr. Matt Schreiber. Matt's an amazing physician and uh, really a great leader, but he painted a horrific picture of what was to come with COVID. And I got to tell you, he was spot on. I came home from from the office uh, very depressed. Uh, I said to my wife, I didn't sign up for this. If I had just left on February 14th, if I had told Daryl I wasn't going to stay on, I'd be sitting home retired like she was. But now I had to do it, and I had to go back and make my night rounds that night, and I did. Um, And I was speaking with employees about what was going on. We had six COVID patients in the hospital on Sunday, the 15th of March. Staff I spoke with, the nurses and the doctors were geared up for whatever was to come. They had lots of questions and I had very few answers. But I will tell you that making rounds that evening was personally invigorating. Even though no one had any idea of what was to come, our staff at Newark Beth was ready to take on the challenge. Over the next few weeks, as Matt had predicted, the hospital emptied out. Inpatient units were like ghost towns. There was no elective surgery going on. OPD was empty. We started to flex down staff and to burn off some PTO. But then the census started to grow. And PPE issues, PPE issues started to abound. Our leaders had a real fear that our supply chain, supply chain disruption was real. Although I will tell you that we never ran out of any kind of PPE. But we had to limit the availability of it. People were used to having PPE available on the shelf. Go pick out whatever you need. And now they were limited to make sure that we didn't overuse our supplies. And staff pushback became acute as well. In HR, we were bombarded with ADA requests. Let's face it, folks were just plain scared and they didn't know what to do. And then employees started to get sick. By June 1, I will tell you that more than 700 of our employees, more than 20% of our workforce had contracted COVID. And uh, that was a scary thing, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, One of the first things we did in HR was we centralized call outs to track the illness. 
We expanded our employee health department so that each call out could be screened by an RN or an APN. We established protocols so that every employee who was sick would get a call from an RN or an APN every two days. And by the way, these calls were so well appreciated by staff. I can't tell you how many employees, when they returned to work after being sick, thanked us for making those calls because they couldn't get in touch with their doctors and our nurses were the ones who were giving them whatever advice and encouragement and support was available. Operationally, our command center was in uh, action 24 hours a day. We created huge manpower pools. We cohorted patients on nursing units, effectively changing the model of care delivery. It truly was one minute at a time management. It was very intense. On March 25th, I woke up with a 99.5 feet. If I had not known what we knew about COVID, usually starts with a low fever, I would have simply taken some Tylenol and gone to work. But on March 25th, I stayed home. I had seven days of low-grade fevers. It was very frustrating not being able to help those still at work who were struggling with all of the issues that we had from employee fear, and PPE needs, and just the support and encouragement that our staff uh, really could have used from me. Um, I did my emails, I did my conference calls, I tried to direct the HR team as we morphed from being recruiters and employee relations specialists to a whole new set of roles. They needed my support as well, and I couldn't deliver it to them, and I felt really bad because I wasn't that sick. But the workforce continued to get sick. Staffing became an issue. As I said, more than 20% of our workforce got sick. And included early on in that group was our chief nursing officer, our chief medical officer, our chief quality officer, and most of the senior nurse leaders. We all got exposed to COVID before we had any idea that there was even any COVID present in our hospital. Now, for me, the last five days, after the seven days of low-grade fever, the last five days got to be very scary. I was very sick. I never had the respiratory symptoms associated with this severe disease, but instead I had a whole host of gastrointestinal symptoms, which let me tell you, were not pretty, and that's all I'm going to tell you about that. I also had the headaches, the encephalopathy, the fatigue. I really could not function. I couldn't do those emails. I couldn't do those calls. I really was just sleeping and being as miserable as one could imagine and scared. I went out and I got a pulse oximeter, uh, which I was lucky to find a friend who had me so that I could check my oxygen saturation, which is where we fear the, um, uh, the respiratory distress comes on. And every time I used it, before I put my finger into that little hole, I was petrified. But my saturation was always above 90%. I didn't eat for five days. I lost 15 pounds, which is back, by the way. Uh, COVID as a weight reduction strategy is not uh, sustainable. Um, but finally, my fever broke. I felt better. But then I had to wait three days to be fever free before I could be returned, cleared to return to work. I returned to work on April 10th. By that time, we had more than 425 COVID patients hospitalized at Newark Beth Israel. You walked around the units, nurses and doctors were in spacesuits. You could not recognize them. We had more details on every shift. It was morbid. We had a robust and functioning manpower pool. And we rounded and rounded and rounded as senior leaders with our president, rounding almost every night in the organization. He took the night shift. Well, as you rounded, it almost felt as business as usual in terms of how folks were working, except for the fact that they were in spacesuits and you couldn't tell who they were. Nurses were sitting at the WOWs, respiratory care professionals were doing their thing, doctors were seeing patients, folks were taking x-rays, employees were delivery, delivering meals, it became a really weird normal. But the specter of the disease was ever present. Four of our employees died in the six week period after March 15th. And dozens of our employees were hospitalized. But with all of this going on around us, our staff was focused, focused on the mission, focused on safety and focused on each other. 
Never in my 32 years at the Beth had I felt an energy and vibe quite like this. We'd successfully gone through financial crises, mergers, joint commission inspections, bad leapfrog scores, great leapfrog scores, celebrating great leapfrog scores, but nothing drove employee engagement at all levels, at all levels like COVID. By early May, the surge was over. Units started closing and our census dropped below 200. Employees were returning to work after being ill and some many commenting on those calls that they got every two days from employee health. But our business was gone. As with other businesses in the US, the conversation turned to the future, to the new care model, to our financial position, to how do we get a safety program re-energized and the ever-present worry about a second, fear, a second wave. My personal recovery was not instantaneous, by the way, even though I was back at work full time, I was fatigued for over four weeks after I recovered. I went home every day and took a two hour nap. And on June the 5th, <clears throat> I worked my last day as CHRO at North Beth Israel. I finally made it to the finish line that I had thought about a year and four months earlier. The months, did February, months since February did not work out as I expected. Had no three day work weeks, no feet up on the desk, no victory lap, although they did have some very nice celebrations for me as I exited the organization after 32 years. But I have to tell you, those last three months were among the most fulfilling experience of my life. I always considered myself a healthcare worker, been in the healthcare field for 40 years, but I really couldn't say that I contributed to the care of individual patients. I'm a supporter, a cheerleader, an organizer, a planner, and a manager. The crisis brings folks closer and closer to the work, and the experience of COVID capped my career with a sense of purpose and accomplishment. I, along with our other 3,700 employees, felt like a hero. Just the next slide here. This uh, sidewalk chalk appeared on the hospital in late March. To this day, or at least through June 5th, from the last day I was at the hospital, the hospital environment felt like this. We were all heroes in the eyes of each other and in the eyes of the public. But heroes don't last forever. Their accomplishments become forgotten, the, the spotlight fades, the days of heroism become fleeting. So the question that we need to ask ourselves in addition to how do we rebuild our business, how do we change our care model, how do we reinvigorate our safety program, how do we deal with the financial crisis that will eventually kick in in healthcare again, how do we capitalize on that feeling of heroism and purpose before we return to normal, whatever that means? So let's take a few seconds and think about what happened in, uh, in healthcare in the last 10 years. I think we've bombarded our employees with certain messages that really were not all that inspiring. We focused on financial performance. We focused on HRO and safety issues. We hear and pass this along to our employees that healthcare costs too much, that it is inefficient, that we need to become smarter, better, faster. We create too much harm. Our delivery model is gonna change. Population health is coming. Those are the messages of the last 10 years. And doing this is like trying to change the tires on your car while you're driving 60 miles an hour. But we were trying and we were making progress as I think healthcare in America has done over the last 10 years. But we also have seen a change in the social nature of the workplace. That generational change that affects loyalty to the organization. And I think we've all experienced it over the last 10 years. I worked there 32 years. I would never have worked anywhere else. I don't know that the generation coming on board these days has that view of the workplace, that it is a place they will spend their entire careers. The three day work week, I think, has really hurt the social nature of healthcare. The consolidation, the fact that we all work for huge organizations. We no longer work for the local hospital with a local mission. Are we still part of the community or are we just another big business in 2020? 
So these messages about cost, quality, and delivery models changing, I do not believe are motivating to healthcare frontline workers. And not surprisingly, employee engagement in our organization and in healthcare in general across the United States is flat. For almost 20 years, we have not moved a needle on employee engagement, despite all of our efforts. Personally, I never looked at the workplace through rose-colored glasses. The future is where I wanted to be. And I expected everything, I expected it to be everything we worked so hard to achieve in healthcare. But now we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to capitalize on this horrific pandemic to change the nature of our relationship with our workforce and to keep that feeling of being a healthcare hero alive. So I believe there is a fundamental change in the fabric of healthcare organizations that are driven off of COVID. We all know that life in healthcare will never be the same. Life in the world will never be the same. But as we adapt to the new world of healthcare, as we adapt to whatever that new normal will look like, we need, to, we need our employees to be supportive of all of this change of healthcare models and of protocols on how we care for patients. And as I look back at my experience, I find three themes that emerged for me that make me feel optimistic about maintaining these high levels of employee engagement. The first one is attachment to mission. The second one is realization of the importance of teamwork. And the third one is a renewed commitment to our continuing journey towards high reliability. So let's start with mission. Chris Ganey tells us that organizational mission is among the highest correlations with high levels of employee engagement. I think it comes just after ease of parking on the employee satisfaction survey. But for healthcare workers, the pandemic was game on. I've never been a firefighter, but I imagine that when that quote comes in for a fire, the adrenaline gets pumping and it is game on for firefighters. When a soldier goes into combat, there's 100% focus on what he or she is doing. Game on. And healthcare workers are now doing around the world what they were trained to do, save lives. They didn't train to save dollars. They didn't train to increase market share. They didn't train to learn to be a high reliability organization. They didn't train to transition to population health as we've asked them to do for decades. Those are not messages that energize the workforce. But with COVID, we're talking about doctors, nurses, professionals, service staff, literally all taking their lives in their hands with every interaction, not just around patient interactions as well. Community spread in the facility was probably very large, but we were saving lives. So people were energized and as scared as staff was, just imagine how scared the patients and the family members were. But we became energized around that mission, caring for really, really sick folks. Our community responded in incredible ways. There were daily shout outs of support from the community. We heard from Magic Johnson. We heard from Shaquille O'Neal, who by the way was born in Newark. We heard from local towns and local businesses. We heard from our city leaders. There were countless police and fire drive-bys blowing their horn to recognize all the people inside working so hard to care for the community. One day, the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds flew over the hospital. You could hardly get a spot on the rooftop to watch them fly by. It was incredibly inspiring to watch that show. And we got donations from local businesses and restaurants. In fact, we were able to provide every employee with free food, for six weeks on all shifts due to the donations of food that came into the hospital. And as we all know, food is what makes healthcare run. Throughout New York and New Jersey, I don't know if you've seen this around the country, at shift change at 7 p.m., folks came out of the balconies and on their front lawns, banging pots and pans, sirens to cheer for healthcare workers. What an inspiring thing to have everyone in New York and New Jersey recognizing how hard healthcare workers were working and how they were risking their lives to care for the community. Signs popped up on lawns, 
uh, and pride in my organization and in what we do was at its highest level in 32 years. That is astounding. Because our mission, I believe, had been subverted for, for, for 20 years. We had not really focused on the mission of saving lives and providing health care to the community. We focused on all of those other things. But here it is today, mission, right back on top of the things that healthcare workers are thinking about and that organizations are feeling. We have the hearts of our employees in our hands. We need to take advantage of this. This is a proud moment to say one is a healthcare worker on the front lines of COVID. But this level of pride and attachment to mission won't stay there for long unless we as leaders somehow figure out how to keep it there. The second theme that uh, came through really clearly was teamwork because we became energized around each other. Asking each other, what can I do for you, became a very common phrase in the hospital. So the social nature of the organization seemed to return from years ago. Employees around the organization connected in ways that had been missing for years. How's your family? How are you doing? What can I do to help you? Those messages had not been ones we were giving regularly, even though we knew that we should have. And overnight, our entire method of delivery, model for delivering healthcare had changed. Med surge nurses became ICU nurses. Pediatricians were caring for adults. Outpatient staff at all levels of the organization, from managers to RNs to clerical staff, became frontline caregivers. A cadre of staff were runners so that the nurses never had to leave the units. Support staff stepped in in more ways and more areas than we could count. Everyone helped everyone else. Managers connected with their employees in ways we had been begging them to do for years. They were spending more time on the floors, less time in their offices, supporting and educating their teams. The number of manager recognitions on our recognition platform doubled. Every day, stories of heroism, creativity, and resourcefulness were told at our organizational hubs and retold at our department hubs. And the staff looked out for each other. The number of peer-to-peer -peer recognitions jumped up as well. We instituted a feed from the social platform on WorkProud that was displayed in the cafeteria so that employees could see other employees being recognized. It went viral. And our senior leaders rounded and rounded and rounded. And that made a huge difference. Employees celebrated together as discharged employees, as employees who were sick were discharged from the organization. We had huge clap outs to celebrate their going home. And we mourned those four employees who died. But we came through it together. Like the rough riders of an earlier day, those who took part in this experience are forever bonded. The third theme that I think came through in the COVID experience is safety. And I believe that safety is our number one goal in healthcare here. We have to reduce the harm that we inflict on the public due to unintended human error. We do that all too often in healthcare. And despite all of our efforts to correct it over the last whatever decades, it's still a problem in healthcare. And our journey to high reliability, I believe, is a viable solution. This thing really works. We'd actually reduced our serious safety events by more than 50% in 18 months when we began our journey towards high reliability. But admittedly, our organization was slow to the table with high reliability. We didn't get our first leapfrog A until 2018. But we've embraced our safety culture and it was just there and was there just in time for COVID. I'll give you an example. One day I came upon a staff member who was not a regular direct caregiver. She had just put on PPE and was about to enter a patient room to deliver a tray. Another staff member called out for her not to go in. She wanted to check her PPE to make sure it was on properly. I believe one of the key tenets of high reliability, one that I've heard is the most important behavior in a safety culture, is peer coaching and peer checking. The story I told you is a great example of that. We need to continue peer engagement as we improve safety in our organization. You know that employee who says, don't tell me what to do. I know my job. We all have them. 
a so self-sure employee that they know they never made an error and they would never make an error. Those are the most dangerous employees you'll ever meet. With COVID, even those folks asked for help. Another interesting corollary from COVID was that employee injuries went down. Needle sticks went down. Back injuries went down. Reducing employee injury is part of safety. But COVID proves that when we are fully engaged in our jobs and present in the moment, personal safety improves. And when personal safety improves and injuries go down, we believe patient safety will improve as well because any safety program starts with the individual. So as we return to normal, whatever that looks like, safety will be our top priority, that I am sure. The COVID experience can carry us forward, can carry us to new heights as we, quest to, as we resume our quest to make healthcare safer. Slide flip. There we go. So as I mentioned earlier, we need to keep the feeling of being a healthcare hero alive. We can't let it fade away. Our leaders need to make sure that that feeling that our healthcare staff has, that attachment to mission, that teamwork and social re-engagement in the workplace, and that journey towards safety remains something we become something we can actually capitalize on. Everything is in front of us. Whatever healthcare looks like, it hinges on the engagement of our employees. So how do we keep that feeling of heroism when the adrenaline and public recognition and support goes away? With that, let me turn it over to Dr. Bob Nelson. So firstly, obviously, thank you, Zach. That's an emotional story for all involved and yeah, a reminder of how lucky we are to have uh, you know folks in healthcare willing to be at that front line. Uh, and of course, you know, our hearts go out to the the folks and families that were directly affected at your hospital, all in, in the in the line of, of of saving the rest of us. So, but the question of sustainability, of a sense of uh, you know what's the important parts of uh, you know the mission, and, and in this case, you know safety and teamwork. Well, uh, I, I wanted to to bring Bob Nelson, who's somebody uh, that we've worked with. Uh, for many years and is in the space of, of helping with, with culture and, and helping create cultures where people, again, can be proud of that work because we think that sense of pride is what drives some of those key missions. Uh, for those that don't know Bob, he's an excellent uh, speaker, an acclaimed author, uh, a study of the field of, uh, of, of recognition and the impact it can, and can have. And so without further ado, Bob, I'll pass it uh, across to you to share some of your experiences. Thank you, Michael and Zachary. I'm glad you're still with us. You're you're the only person I've I've uh, known that's gotten COVID, and I'm in a hot hot state. I'm in California, so uh, we're we're hunkered down, or or a lot of us are hunkered down. Some are are out at beaches and whatnot, but uh, we're we're all hoping to get through this. Uh, I'm excited to be uh, a part of this and be with you and um, today, and and uh, to add my my uh, thoughts on Zachary's excellent presentation and what your what uh, Zachary shared happening in, in his hospital is really uh, kind of mirrors what's happening in organizations not maybe not to the same intensity but to some of the same results. Josh Burson um, recently said that COVID nineteen may be the best thing to ever happen to employee engagement, and so uh, we see the, the same type of thing. Uh, maybe for some different reasons that that um, are occurring across the country, and it, it, in some ways, it's quite refreshing. Uh, having spent my entire career in, in this field of recognition and more recently engagement, uh, recent research by Wills Towers Watson has found that uh, the 90 percent of companies currently believe their culture has improved uh, in with the um, the whole epidemic. The pandemic, rather, 83% believe their employee experience is now better, and 84% believe employee engagement has gone up. Why? Why is this? Well, not unlike what, what Zachary Zach was sharing, that for many managers, they suddenly all their employees are are most of the employees are working at home, and they're by themselves, maybe at home themselves. And they can't help but to have to reach out to people to see what they're doing, how they're doing, and yes, can I help you with something? 
all the things that we, as Zach said, that uh, they should have been doing all along, but now they have to, to function, to operate. And and they, they're met with the response where they, the people feel uh, more valued. They're, they're, they're more visible. They're, they're more important. I know my, my um, wife is a computer scientist. She changed jobs here in the pandemic. And uh, it was, we were both stunned and dumbfounded when her, her vice president of IT for the company she works for personally delivered <laughs> computer equipment and, and uh, everything she needs. And, and she said, I, I can come by the office and pick that up. No, 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 we'll, we'll bring it out to you. And um, wow, that, that makes a, a big statement that uh, every worker is important. Every worker uh, is, is helping to make a difference. And what, if, whatever we can do to best help them do that job is going to make us all successful. It's a refreshing, refreshing message that brings us front and center to the, the topic of, of engagement. So how do we sustain this? <clears throat> and I, I've, got, I've got to go back to the topic I feel uh, most uh, grounded. I did my doctoral research on the topic of employee recognition. And uh, we, we sustain this by recognizing rewarding high performance first and foremost, and, and making that a part of, of every day going forward, systematically doing, doing that. And um, that's what I'm going, to, I'm going to share. So the value of recognition is, is critical at this time, but critical really to move any, any performance, any needle, any results that you want. Uh, Harvard Business Review, um, as, as in research they published, they found that recognition given for high performance is the most impactful driver of employee engagement. And so um, by way of definition, I, I define recognition as acknowledging and appreciating people for their achievements. Uh, notice it doesn't say acknowledging and appreciating people for showing up, uh, which is, you, you'd have to come to think that must be what people are thinking when you look at what most recognition uh, programs exist across our country. I've worked with, um, 80% of the Fortune 500 and uh, over a thousand organizations, and and most places uh, they do recognition in a passive way around holidays, around birthdays, around uh, things that really are separate from the mission and strategic objectives and performance that's that's critical for their job and for the team and for the organization, and as a result, they don't get the benefits that recognition can give them if they take it seriously and actually align it with their practices on a daily basis so it's part of their culture. Um, we, we know that um, from my own research that I've, I've found that 99.4% of employees expect to be recognized when they do good work today. And this, this has, has changed. Just if, if we asked the same question 10 years ago, the word expect wouldn't be in there. Because I asked this question uh, over time and it used to be people would say, you know, it'd be nice if my boss said something, if they thanked me <laughs> when I did a good job. But increasingly today, it's, it's more than just nice. It's an expectation that when someone does a good job, they finish a, a project, they help out a coworker, or whatever it is that, yes, we're paying them to do, that they expect to be noticed. This is uh, even especially true for the, the uh, largest generation in the workforce today, the millennials, which have expectation uh, as much as on a daily basis which drives baby boomers nuts because I told you last week you were doing a good job. Well, that was then, what about now? And, and uh, they, 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 don't, they don't want need that because they, they are, um, have a, a frail ego and need to be puffed up. Not at all. They, they want and need that because they're smart enough and resourceful enough to know that in fast moving dynamic times in which we all currently work, that we need validation and we need it on an ongoing basis to be on the mark because what they're going to be asked to do tomorrow is probably different than what they're asked to do yesterday. And the only way to take the guesswork out of it and not have them operating in a vacuum is to be told and acknowledged by their manager, by a peer, by an upper manager, um, maybe by, by even the customer uh, that uh, what you did was very helpful. Thank you so much. Now, uh, so most everyone wants this. How many people get it? Only 12% of of employees currently say that they 
uh, uh, get are recognized in ways that are important and meaningful to them. Three times as many, 34% say they feel uh, they're not recognized in meaningful ways. That is the things that the organization does that's supposed to make them feel motivated and, and valued doesn't work for them, doesn't connect with them. To be a part of a holiday party, for example, or the summer picnic or, or even something for your birthday, it's like it's not performance-based. It's everyone gets it. Uh, it, it doesn't drive um, the, the performance that, that uh, employees want. And employees want to be performers. People that perform well feel great about themselves. Uh, and so uh, they, they want and they need this. So very, very few people actually gain it. Uh, and wouldn't you know, 80% of today's managers feel they're pretty good at this. They read the one minute manager, they know it's important to do these types of things. It's kind of common knowledge, but not common practice. So this is, a, this is what we're up against, that we've got this, I call it the knowing doing gap. We know it's the right thing to do. We know there, there's not a manager that if you ask them, oh yeah, yeah, employees are important, but are they actually doing the things that employees need um, on an ongoing basis to feel important, to feel involved, to feel validated for their daily efforts? And 12% uh, are getting it, 80% of managers are think they're good at it, and this is the gap we need to close. How we do this starts as simple, and I, you know, I've got thousands of, of examples of what recognition looks like in all shapes and sizes, from all types of companies and industries. Uh, one of the books I, I wrote is 1,501 Ways to Reward Employees, 100% real life examples. It's all over the map, but if there's just one thing <laughs> that you focused on and got all your, your managers to focus on, it's this, personal and public praise thanks and praise that and that could be uh, in person in a written note it could be electronically in voicemail or email it could be in public in a staff meeting or for the company meeting or something in the community even but uh, this is the home room for this topic and this this um, I, I did research on 52 explicit behaviors uh, across industries to say what is most important for employees to be motivated. And I'm asking employees directly, and out of the 52 uh, potential uh, choices that I factored into a dozen uh, factors, combination of related variables, we're looking here at uh, four of the, the top 10 are types of praise. And initially in the research, I said, well, isn't this all one thing? Isn't praise praise? Whether it's in person or in public, that's one bucket. What I've learned and what I want to share with you is that, no, it's not one thing. The, each of these items are mutually exclusive. That means in a nutshell that it's something different to thank someone personally to their face. It's, that's different than if you write them a note or if you, whether it's a post-it or a formal letter, something that they, they can take home and share with their family or put in their victory file so that uh, when they have a bad day, they can go back and reflect on the great job they've been doing. It's different than getting a, a voicemail that someone's gonna listen to three or four times uh, or, or having something said in public about you in front of others that is very validating as well. So you got, you got fire on each of these cylinders to maximize the power of this topic of recognition. In a nutshell, it's, it's, it's having uh, leaders, having peers, having top management say, hey, I saw what you did. And with today, people working from home, we don't know what they did. We've got we've to actually find out and, and, and then validate that. I saw, I saw what you did. I appreciate that in, in some way, your own words. Here's why it's important. Provide a larger context. Here's how it ties to our core values or to our strategic objectives, to that our team goals for this month. As you tie it to a larger context, it has more power, more meaning, uh, more value to the employee. Um, and if you really want to leave a mark, get to the level of feelings. Here's how it makes me feel personally. I'm proud you're on my team uh, or, or some such. Because if you can if you can do this, even if it's ten seconds in the hallway or ten or in on a Zoom call, it, it says that uh, I noticed you. What you've done is important, and it's important to me. And that sends a valuable message that everyone today needs to hear and wants to hear. The validation of how they're spending their, their time and the bulk of their working hours is making a difference. 
Um, so I know Mark Twain used to say I can live for two weeks on a good compliment. I think it's up to, up to several months now based on partly how infrequently this happens or how the fact that most of us are, are at a distance now, but even before COVID, we spend most of our time on computer screens and the personal touch has, has eroded. And so we've got to, we've got to make sure that that's still a part of the message that we have. Uh, and we, and we, there's no substitute to actually making the connection uh, in person with people or, or allowing, uh, setting up a way for others to do that um, with their peers or, or looping in upper management and, and have it be a priority for them. So in, again, even if it's, if it's uh, only 10 seconds, it, um, there's a lot going on with this basic, simple strategy. Of course, praising people directly is critical, but you can also praise them in front of others, which includes a, a Zoom call, by the way. It, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, we don't have to all be in the same room to make it happen. You can praise someone uh, even when they're not around to hear it, knowing that nine times out of 10, word will get back to them. Here's what your boss said about the great job you did. Kind of, I, I refer to this as positive gossip. Wouldn't it be great if in your organization there's this positive buzz of people excited about the achievements we're doing and what we're doing to, to, to work together and, and who helped me out. And, and as opposed to, you know, uh, fear and politicking and, and uh, all the negativity and cynicism that will happen if you don't do this positive stuff. So if you have a challenge of that in your organization, the way to, to undo that is not to say you can't be cynical anymore, but to overwhelm that system with a positivity that, that, that stems from each conversation, each interaction with employees individually or as a group. So that's the, the heart of uh, this message. And then where you can go from there is all over the map. I wanna give you just a couple other, other uh, tips on, on things that um, certainly you wanna talk with each person uh, individually or as a team about what recognition, how they like to be recognized. If you do a good job, I wanna thank you. What would be meaningful to you? Don't guess, don't, a lot of managers just do what's meaningful to them and they don't stop to say, well, what's meaningful to the person? And if you stop and check, you're gonna be surprised. A lot of times it's not gonna be the things that you thought they were, that uh, someone might, uh, sometimes managers are, are fearful. They say, well, they're gonna ask for more money and maybe they will, but I find 90, 99% of the time, it's other things that, that uh, come up. Flexibility or autonomy or a chance to be a part of a decision, uh, uh, two-way communication, um, or if I make a mistake, being uh, a focus on learning instead of fault. Instead of embarrassing me in front of my peers, can we talk about, I'm not gonna make that mistake again, can we talk about uh, how how we can um, amplify that learning going forward. You can, um, you, in general, uh, my recommendation is to try to, as a uh, on a daily basis, to recognize employees so that they will each get fill it at least weekly. So you've got, as a leader, you've got to be doing more of this all the time as part of your behavioral repertoire to have employees fill it, uh, each fill it some. Now, this isn't every person every day, but every day, someone. So it's part of what your becomes a habit of what you do in calling out performance and if different shapes and sizes that you see it. This is part of how you get it as an ongoing part of, of your operation and ultimately part of your organization's culture. Uh, for example, you can start staff meetings with some type of recognition. Yeah, very quick, very simple. You can allow people to thank each other. Does anyone else have any praisings? And take a couple minutes to do that before we get into the agenda. Or, or you can, on occasion, try a, a, something like a praise barrage, which is a fun activity. You can do it on Zoom, okay, that, that we, you, you go through and you ask, you ask everyone to, um, uh, when, when we call out someone's name, everyone to say things they, they value working with that person. Just take very quickly, and it's very powerful uh, to to the employees to hear that. And, and finally, you can um, you you need to be learning from each other as you go to become a self learning culture on this topic. Uh, the best organizations I work with, they they do this. They're, the leaders are learning from each other. They're they're experimenting. They're trying new things. And when something works, they tell others about it, and they emulate that. And that how it becomes anchored in the culture. If you do this, if you do this well, then um, you will create a value 
a, a culture of recognition. And uh, this is, to me, the, the gold standard of what you want because it will drive all the other things that, that uh, are important uh, to you as an organization. Your employees will feel five times more likely to feel valued. They will be six times more likely to strongly endorse the organization as a great place to work. They will be seven times more likely to stay with the company, ideally for their career, if possible. This is worth the price of admission right here that this can be your ticket to, to not having to, in a, in a day of, of tight, of, of being difficult to hire skilled workers, that um, you will be a magnet for talent and, and people will stay with you longer. And, and finally, you will you be 11 times more likely to feel completely committed to their jobs, to their manager, to the organization. So, so how do you bring this to, to bear and, and what they did at, at um, Beth Israel Hospital is a, at some point when you get serious about this, you create a platform where it can more easily be done that has tools that people can use, at, at uh, leaders can use, employees can use, peer-to-peer -peer based, organizational tracking, and the gold standard to make this happen is to move it to a software platform. And, um, and with that, you can also have a, an app to make it easy to use, and everyone has their, their phones today, so this makes it universal and makes this reality uh, more important. And this is, this is the, the thing that um, Online Rewards does um, that, uh, that helped to sponsor this and, and why uh, I've been so excited to work with them is, as, as Zachary did. We're looking at the, the screen that uh, they use there. And, and uh, Michael, if, if you're still uh, with us, if, or, or Jim, if, if you want to uh, transition here to uh, um, our wrap up, and then we'll we'll take any questions for Zachary. Or it's, it's not one size fits all. You know, there are different approaches to doing this, and so there should be because there are different cultures and there are different industries and there are different mechanical circumstances. And probably more interesting about you know our approach to doing this is we see the value in the recognition as the emphasis and not in the value of the reward. While there's a role for rewards and different types of creative rewards have a role in this. Really what we're trying to capitalize on is the fact that uh, there's a lot of technology, the employed populations are comfortable using technology, and how is technology able to support building a culture where people can be made proud of the work they do and proud of the company and the role of recognition as a driver for creating that sense of pride. As a great summary I'll sort of share with you, Oprah Winfrey once says, uh, hey, after every presentation I make and there's the interviews, you know, the microphone drops and, and that's whether it's the President Obama or the Bushes or Beyonce, et cetera, you know, the uh, the interviewee says, hey, how did I do? And so there, you know, clearly it doesn't matter if you're the President, Beyonce or otherwise, you're reaching for that affirmation and recognition is a way of which you can actually answer that by saying to an individual person, you know, whether it's the peer or the manager, I see you, you know, and I see what you do and what you do is meaningful and valuable to us all. And that's really what we're trying to, you know, connect to and bring to life inside organizations and cultures. All right. Well, so thanks for the opportunity, Jim. I'll pass it uh, uh, back to you from, from the sort of conclusion as we transition, you know, from the presentation phase and into more of a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the discovery and the conversation phase. Perfect. So, yes, thank you, everybody, for your presentations. Um, I, like I said, Zach, that, really sort of, that resonated with me personally. Dr. Bob, great as always, a lot of great insights there. Um, I wanted to just drop another quick housekeeping note that we will be sending, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, a copy um, complimentary of, of WorkCrowd of 1001 Ways to Engage Employees. So we will be following up with you via email. Um, so keep an eye out for that on um, the logistics for that. Um, and now I wanted to transition into a Q&A panel with our three presenters today. We've had a lot of great questions come through already. So I'll start to read those off. But um, anybody watching, um, feel free to drop questions in the chat box and we will have our panelists discuss them. And um, anything that we don't cover, we will be sure to follow up with you post the event. Um, so an interesting one that I received, let me get this in front of me. This is from Gail. Gail asks, what are some of the best examples of online recognition um, when so many team members are working remotely right now? 
So I'll pose that one to the panel. Well, let me see if I could start on that one. Um, the platform we've been using for the last two or three years is a very socially oriented um, program. So there's a feed just like you get off of Facebook or any other social platform, and you decide who you want to follow and not follow. We've created some rubrics within there for departments and for certain kinds of uh, groups, but that way you get notified when there is uh, recognition going up and making that recognition public in that way has helped but I think that one of the things that really took off during the COVID experience was putting that recognition on the display screens around the hospital because as Dr. Bob said people love public recognition uh, we're, we're in a generation where uh, one of our psychologists says everybody wants a trophy every day um, so let's give them one and there are ways to get them to to, to realize that you get one, you give one. And putting it in front of the workforce in the cafeteria on these display screens, but also putting it in front of the public in our lobbies and our waiting rooms to show them how we recognize each other. It just creates a whole atmosphere of support for employees and for patients. Um, this is easy to make this public these days. Excellent, let me just add to that. You know, there's, there's so many strategies. Uh, don't uh, don't don't feel you can't do this because people are online or or, or working remotely. Uh, Hyatt, for example, they assign buddies in work work teams where they're responsible for helping to especially catch one other person on the team when they do things right, or they do a they do an inventory. They hand all the all their the team members where they fill out again things that they value hobbies they have information about their 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 personal life and their the families and all all the more you know about someone the more fodder you have to motivate them not to trick them to work harder but to truly align with with their aspirations my my definition of engagement is to is the personal is alignment of personal aspirations with organizational objectives and the person to do that is the leader for any given team Um, this is an interesting one that I am interested in everybody's thoughts on, and it's around sort of the timing of everything. So approximately, would you state changing a culture takes time and or is it an average of three to six months? Would you put an actual time frame on, hey, we started here and then we've changed our culture? What What is the end time frame around something like that? Sure. The, an the answer is yes, <laughs> because it, you know people are, are eager to get going on this, and I'm sure Michael can speak to this. And then, you know, it, it takes them eight months to make a decision on the next step. You know, or they've got to we, well, we need this information from you. Okay, we'll get right on that. And then three months later, they they're they're still debating it. So it can move as fast as the organization is ready. And uh, I, I've seen. And in the in the literature, you know, organizational change seven to eight years is, and I've I've seen organizations flip on this topic in three months if they are if they are ready if they are eager if it's led from the top if the funding is there get out of people's way because this is happening and it's very exciting when that happens. Yeah, and I think that when you do that, you see a quick instantaneous pop because it's new and it's novel and people are engaged. And then like every initiative that we've ever had in management, unless we stay behind it and try to sustain it, it will wane. So um, we were talking earlier, we were talking earlier about um, how, you know, you implement a system like this and then the implementation committee goes, here it is, have a nice day. <laughs> and then who's left behind to sustain it? And how do we sustain it? And where does that fall in the leadership uh, sphere and uh, to keep it front and center because all of our initiatives quickly get tired because we got so many new ones coming right behind them. So and keeping that, it front and center and I think keeping mission up front is really important in healthcare these days. And and tying it into the, the daily practices and in my, my doctoral research on this, I found the top reason why managers don't use recognition with their employees is they didn't know how to do it well. So they were they were hesitant, and and so you gotta you gotta make it easy for them to do. But what starts with understanding it and understanding it's their job. HR is not going to do it from them. The CEO is not going to do it for them. They're in charge of the motivational environment for the people to report to them. And you gotta plant that seed. So to get changes in their behavior, you gotta start with changes 
in their head. All our behavior follows our beliefs and our values. And that's where the, 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 the heavy lifting is, I find. Yeah, and you can manage the data because it's so available on technological platforms to say who's engaged, who's not engaged, which departments are getting high level of recognition, which departments aren't using the tool, and then work with reinforcing that among the frontline managers. Celebrate the successes, coach for the, the downside, the people that aren't on the on the game, aren't in the game. Well, Michael, me, any thoughts? Well, you know, because of course we've seen you know hundreds of companies deploy and roll out these programs, and of course their experiences change as their cultures are, as their programs are that are different, and no doubt getting leadership involvement is a significant variable in driving <laughs> take up rates. But a few observations. One, a program that we've worked with, uh, you know, Bob may talk a little bit about it later, has a almost 90% participation rate within about 90 to 120 days from launch. Now, it got such visibility internally that the CEO, and this is a 30,000 person global organization, the CEO got involved. 40,000. 40,000, thank you. Uh, you know, the CEO got involved, that was a driver, the COO got involved and they love it and now they're engaged. And it's now, we won't say it's fully self-sustaining at that rate yet, but I don't think it's unreasonable for it to self-sustain. Why? Facebook self-sustains, so does Instagram. It's built to do that, all right? So it doesn't need endless nurturing, but the momentum and level of participation has to reach a point whereby people are interested each day to go and see who got recognized? What were they being recognized uh, for? Do I know these people? Am I being recognized? And so inherent in the technology is the ability to at least realize those, though there is still always some work. We have a big retailer, 100,000 plus employees, and their program is over a decade old. And all of the leadership team that were involved in the operation of the program actually were furloughed during the last three months but the program continued and continued on in their absence after 10 years for those staff that were still active. So I think that's a telltale interesting sign that says, once you get the momentum going at the ground groups level, then the activity will continue. Whether the activities are orientated towards some of the performance goals and objectives that you want to influence through the program, well, that's a bit different because you haven't got a leader that's drumming the beat and saying, you know, now we want to focus recognition on safety and teams as your examples below. So it is achievable that it is a self-sustaining level, but you want to keep it moving and keep it alive. But it does take an effort to say, great, we're ready to put this kind of approach, put this kind of culture in place because we want people to feel this way. It can move quite quickly. And as Bob said, as, as quickly as, as your leadership is ready for it to move. You know, the other way, way of putting that is that the, the platform is very intuitive. So you don't need a lot of instructions. You can, people are, they get on it immediately and they can see how it's how it works. And it's easy to, to, to do a recognition or, or here I can like one that's been done or I can add to it. And now now uh, leaders can come in over the top and, and add points or whatever. So it becomes very dynamic, very, very robust. And uh, in on the program that Michael mentioned that um, we're working on together that, uh, we the four out of the five highest users are vice presidents, which I just love because they're said you know it's it, intuitively it's also saying as busy as those people are we're all busy that they're this is important to them that they're actually doing it and so no one else has a excuse not to do it and it's it's very powerful. Uh, that is a beautiful transition to the next question that I was about to ask from Adrian. Adrian asks, if the executive team at your company is not great at providing recognition, what's the best way to encourage them to do so? Recognize them. I like it. Yes. Re yes. Have them feel the power of it. And for a lot of a lot of leaders, they haven't felt the power of it. So it's a, really a blind spot. It's unknown to them. So to make them to thank them for a job they've done, to thank them for the support, for for whatever it might be, uh, is is a starting point for awareness to get them in the game. Or, or uh, like right behind that is make them look good. 
So I work with organizations to say, okay, how can we, we're working with a senior leader, you know, how can we, how can we get them out onto the plant floor? And well, they don't like doing that because they don't remember employees' names, for example. Well, let's have the HR person go with them and, and can remind them of the names or, or introduce them so they don't feel awkward. And so they're left with, wow, I learned a lot on that, on that uh, 10, 20 minutes through the plant. And now they're more likely to do it again because you're, you're helping them um, to win, to, be, to, to look good doing it. Well, let me put it to you also in the context of the healthcare situation. So recognition coming from a physician to a nurse is a very, very powerful uh, capability and tool. Now, physicians walk around connected to their smartphones because it helps them manage the you know, challenges and difficulties of, of their life, both personally and professionally. But it is very realistic to be able to have an experience whereby a physician has finished whatever the task and activity and subject to appropriate you know, sort of conditions and being safe, et cetera, who have worked with a group of nurses on a particularly difficult, you know, challenging situation to literally with their hands without even touching the phone, pick it up and say, I want to recognize these people. Well, the impact that that has on them is substantial. And the technology allows for people to like the recognitions, which tends to be a natural extension of how social media works. And the physician, of course, is seeing that everybody's liking the post they do. So naturally, what's the physician's behavior and activity? He or she is going to do it again. Why? Because it obviously had an impact. People liked it, right? And the physician is being reinforced because all the people were liking the recognition posts. You know, so the question we ask ourselves is, is that an unrealistic, you know, situation to achieve at our hospital? And we're saying, no, it's not unrealistic. Now, not everybody does recognition all the time, as Bob and Zach in their experiences would know. Most of us are programmed to be critical, right? But it actually doesn't take too much to get some of the people over the line. And once they're over the line, then they go, okay, well, that was easy. And people liked it. And I felt good about doing it. And generally with human beings, if it's not hard, right, and they like it, and it has an impact, and it makes you feel good, then you tend to do the same thing again. And of course, it's the idea of how are we spreading that positive energy? And then to Zach's point, how do we use that positive energy to pivot to reinforce around safety, around, you know, teamwork, and around the importance of the mission that we're working together as a, as, uh, you know, as a team. You know, I, oh, go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I'll add to that, um, that I think we oftentimes focus on our frustration of getting our senior leaders to get on board with our programs. Um, and that's a real frustration. Um, but I'm not sure that's where the rubber meets the road. I thought the rubber met the road in COVID with the rounding that we did and not with the recognition that our senior leadership team did. I thought that the impact came when our managers recognized their direct staff and when peer to peer really started to kick in. Um, I think in a lot of ways that peer to peer and that direct supervisor public recognition is much more powerful than recognition from senior leadership teams. So let's not overstate that as a barrier and let's focus on the direct care, the direct supervisor, and let's focus on the peer to peer as a way to really jumpstart your recognition program. Let me just say one more thing about getting the upper management involved is you have to talk their language. So you, no one's going to do this because, oh, this is this sounds fun. This sounds nice. You know, if we have happen to have extra budget and time left over, maybe we'll do it. You guys say this will have this is what will impact the business of the of the operation this is will help us attract talent retain talent better achieve the uh, the metrics uh, all the metrics that are most important to our success through this topic we're not doing this to be nice we're doing this to drive the business and then make that case through the research or even a pilot program uh, whatever it takes because it will it will drive the business and it, and you are able to prove that and I think that there's an opportunity here to really, from an HR perspective, at least from my perspective, to really push the recognition program through engagement uh, at the senior level, through increased budgeting, through change in what we're doing and to redo it. Because that feeling of heroism that I think everybody recognizes, we want to hold on to it. And we know it's not easy to hold on to. So now's the time to go and ask. Double down. Um, 
This this next question comes from Bill and it's directed at Dr. Bob, but I think everybody on the panel um, will have insights in this. The question is, do you always think there should be financial incentive affixed to praise and recognition? At what point does that become an expectation when receiving praise? And how would you motivate people to leverage a new software for recognition versus a traditional email? Well, I do not think that there should always be financial tie to this topic. Uh, and, and some of the slides we skipped over there um, talked about the money. How does money fit into this? And money is definitely a motivator, but it's not the end all. And for a lot of a lot of employees today, 88 percent of millennials, for example, money is not their top motivator. Eighty-eight <laughs> percent. So a lot, a lot of people say, "Well, that's that can't be true." You know, well, it is true. You ask, ask them. You'll find out for yourself that uh, they want life balance, they want autonomy, they want flexibility, they want, they want a, a mentor as a manager, they want opportunity, a lot of other things. And money's not the top. Now, some of those other things lead to more money, and that's fine. But money is not the answer. That's a that's a quick one. So it's the the the, the behavior is uh, the foundation of this topic, the behavior. And then, then if you can add money or a gift card or points, all the better. And maybe you do that for, for bigger things. Or, uh, but um, it, money is not, money is compensation. Everyone has to be paid. It's part of the work contract. Recognition, no one has to do. If you choose to do it, that's where it has the power. And because people say, no, my boss didn't have to do that, and they took the time to, to do it, that's when it really feels special, too. I, I forgot the second half of that question, Jim. Well, let me, I, I want to I want to jump into the uh, the part of the email question, right? And then you know, Zach, share your perspectives in, in the healthcare. So, you know, people ask us a lot about you know the, the technology and the format of the program, and and we're sort of sharing with clients. Look, the form of the recognition experience is fundamental in that we have been trained by the tech titans with trillions of dollars behind them of the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Instagrams and the TikToks and their experiences and their knowledge, skill and capabilities associated with building connectivity between a device right, and whatever that emotional experience is that you have when you're on Facebook or TikTok or the other one is core to what people are expecting because They've been trained at a consumer level of this is the level of experience you should have, number one, and an expectation that that's what it should be like, and it should be like that in the office or the work environment. If at a home personal level, I get to have these amazing experiences with, with technology and, and what's coming through them, then I should likewise have that at work. I can't go from having this amazing cinema experience to then going into the office and there's a little 12 inch black and white television in the corner with a training video on a VHS and then the training department going, you're, you're joking? This doesn't work. You know, I don't even know what that thing is anymore, let alone like I'm, I'm supposed to connect to it. So people's old recognition practices that we come like, and we say, like, seriously, like so, oh, you're so missing the mark. You it's know? like a time warp that you're, you're right. going to work and you're, you're, you're stepping into the 1940s. <laughs> Not using yeah. technology, uh, you know, yeah, we command like and control. Right, whether we like it or not as the new generation just doesn't matter because this is the level that you need to be at and you need to speak in the language and format. And this thing, right, is the most powerful tool for this kind of experience. Why? Because it's connected to you and you do this several times a day, right? And it's not, they're not looking at the phone. They're looking at what's coming through the phone. And so we're trying to say, look, make sure that the things that are coming through the phone as it relates to work in a healthcare setting is saying, these are other people that I work with. I know these people and they're doing amazing things. And look at that. A, a senior lead has commented on some recognition that I've given or I've done. And I'm feeling good about that. And a physician finishes the shift. He goes, wow, look at my people and writes a comment. On it. So that's what we're trying to get to from a, you know, sort or of. Not, or Michael, great. Or not even that, just the fact that they like the comment. I, 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 I'm, I'm hearing from frontline employees that say, my VP liked the recognition I got. They know who I am. They know what I did. Life is good. This is, right. it brings it all front and center. Uh, that's the power of this. 
sorry, Zach, I, we, we cut you off. What's your perspective given you've been doing this for a long time? So I heard a study years ago, I have no idea where it came from or if it's even true, that an employee asks for a raise and you give him a raise. And then the question that they surveyed was, how long after that employee got a raise were they satisfied with their new rate of pay or did they think they needed a new raise? And the answer was one and a half paychecks. <laughs> I believe it. One and a half, and, and I'm sure it's gotten worse in the last. Or shorter, years. or shorter. If uh, they talked to a right. peer that got one uh, percent, two percent more in their pay raise. <laughs> Compensation is such a is such a negative uh, thing. It's very hard to make it into positives when you give reward. But there is no way to make recognition negative. You could say, you gave me a raise, but it's not enough. You gave me a raise, but uh, or I got a bonus, but I should have had more. But nobody can say, you gave me recognition. I'm sorry you did that. Don't do that again. Give me more. So uh, to answer also just that one final part, and we'll go to the next question, is so in the things where, in the programs we're deploying in all their various shapes and sizes, there is a monetary dimension, and the monetary dimension can link to you know, the points and the gamification experiences and the gift cards. It can do charity experiences. It can do PTO experiences of some clients. It can go through to payroll in that in most organizations, there is money and budget that is floating around in various buckets, but they're all over the place and they're spread out and they're not unified and centralized. So one element or one aspect of you know, the way you should look at how you're, you're doing things is to say, bring those together, all right? The employees should have sort of one destination point where all these interesting programs kind of come to life. And if you still like doing the, the, the picnics or the birthdays and things like that, there's nothing, it's not like they're terrible, but bring them all together and make sure you're using them in the right way and see which ones are having an impact. And conversely, there is a role for recognition at a non-monetary level. At saying thanks and, and appreciation and feedback right, and positive energy. And there is a role for monetary where the budgets permit. And that is a, a certain set of users might have monetary delivery capabilities, you know, within whatever budget constraints that, you know, that the hospital or the organization has and with whatever workflow approval processes. So there is a role. It's not one's great and the other's no good. It's how do you use them in conjunction and to create a positive experience. But as you're hearing from you know, Bob and Zach, and we agree, but with a greater emphasis on the value of recognition because it's free, so finance likes it. People like it and appreciate it. It's totally underutilized in most organizations as an actual strategic objective. And as that correctly said, whether we like it or not, you know, pay is what we bring the people into the company for, but the culture is a bigger impact on the retention strategies, right? So how are you using your money and your rewards and your budgets? What are you really trying to do, you know? So anyway, uh, uh, back to you, you know, Jim, for any last questions. So this one's kind of interesting. That's sort of building on that topic of rewards and appreciation sort of in the context of what's going on right now. Um, from Alexandria, she asks, what type of strategies do you suggest that we can implement um, for employee recognition with social distancing in mind, we used to have food trucks come out for appreciation, and now we're not able to. So what? how could we sort of address that with technology now with, in the world that we're living in? Well, I'll just do one quick thing. So the first thing is, you know, so you need to, so tools like this and recognition for remote, absolutely fundamental, right? May, may be more important, and, and it's obviously the question of the mix of where are, the people, are they working still in the hospitals or are they remote? But uh, actually for a local hospital, we're delivering digital uh, rewards for people that want to get to choose between a Papa John's, a Pizza Hut or a California Pizza Kitchen Deliver, i.e. they're trying to sort of hang on to some of that experience. You know, the question is, do you want to do that when people are sitting at home? You know, that's... Uh, we yeah. did this for the webinar. Everyone gets a, a slice of pizza. So that's a my my wife um, in last Friday had a had a uh, virtual happy hour, and the the company called everyone beforehand and said, "Do you want alcohol or do you want snacks?" And whatever they had, they and they sent they sent a box to our house, and it was it was snacks, and um, you know 
but that was part of the uh, social happy hour. You don't have to be you don't have to be in the same room to do this stuff. <laughs> you just have to be a little bit more creative. I think the group the group recognition is hard, um, but it can be replaced with individual recognition, and I really think that's a more uh, motivating thing than the group recognition. Group recognition is important. I think it's important to celebrate years of service. It's important to celebrate birthdays. I think you have to have all those things out there in the background. But it is this individual recognition that we're talking about that really enhances individual performance and really moves the organization forward. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more. This is an interesting one from Kathleen that I think, um, Zach, you might have spoken to this a little bit already in your presentation, but um, in a setting where employees can't have cell phones during the day while working due to safety, being on a plant floor, et cetera, how can technology be used to recognize? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, for years, as I rounded around the hospital, one of the things that we all did as senior leaders is try to get people off of their phones, right? You'd go and you'd see a nurse on her phone, why are on your phone? You should be taking care of patients. Our employees are not engaged because they're on their phones all day long. We all hear that. Um, right. But you know what? We have been unsuccessful in getting people off of their phones, and we're unsuccessful in getting ourselves off of our phones. So let's where that device is an acceptable tool, let's make it something that is engaging for work. So maybe when we see them on their cell phones, instead of shopping on Amazon, they're actually looking at recognition and giving recognition. So we can't change their attachment and uh, the psychologists don't like when I say this, addiction to these devices, but we can make sure that you're using it for a good purpose. You can also have, opportunity. You can all, it's, it's very common to have, you can have uh, cards that walk around, walk around cards that executives or managers can use to catch someone doing something right here in the moment. And that can have a value, that can have a code that goes back to the, or that could be a, a lunch coupon in the cafeteria. Um, you, you also in, in, in um, like in environments that aren't computer oriented, like a manufacturing plant floor, a lot of times they'll have a kiosk that's, that's where people can go and, and check in on breaks or I, I uh, Worked one organization. They they put iPads in the break rooms that people could access um, because they each didn't have a a, a laptop, a computer. Uh, Again, where there's a will, there's a way. Jack, you spoke specifically too to how at your hospital you actually had a feed of the recognitions on a screen. So there's ways yeah, to get them. That's great. Yeah. All right, Kyle. All right. Uh, um, I think we have time for one last more. So this comes from Eli. And it's kind of a tough question, but is is there a tipping point where recognition doesn't suffice in a culture where a tremendous amount is asked of employees, such as now where we are, some employees are furloughed or non full time status, salaries have been reduced, et cetera. So what's the tipping point for recognition? <laughs> well, in terms of it being too much or, or I'm not sure I understand the question. So I think. It, when employees are sort of pushed, is is there a point to where recognition even isn't enough because they're they're being pushed so hard that? Well, I think I think the key is to not make it be a push. It's not this isn't something forced on people. If it's if it's integrated with what you need from them and what you want them to do and and what they want to do. Again, it's we're both in it together. It's not something uh, we're doing to someone. It's something we're doing with someone. If you truly make that happen, um, you don't run into that problem. You don't. Uh, people will surprise you because their their ability to do more will supersede what you expect of them. <laughs> if you truly have them motivated, uh, they, they have, it's an, it, humans have an infinite potential. I, I, I'm definitely convinced that it, to tap into that is is through these these tools and the environment and the attitude and philosophy on the part of, of leadership to to make this real. Yeah, you bring me back to 2009, where we laid off about 10% of our workforce. And then it came time for, you know, a holiday party or a group, group recognition. We were saying, why are you doing that? You laid off employees. We shouldn't be spending money on recognition. And actually, what we did is we doubled down on recognition uh, because we thought that it became even more important. So if we're going to still be around after all of those financial crises and furloughs and layoffs, it's going to be because somehow we've 
capture the hearts and minds of the people who still work for us. They still want to be part of our organization. So let's attach them back to the mission. Let's push the social nature of the work. Uh, let's push the social nature of the workforce. And um, let's make sure that people remain engaged in their jobs. Because it, it does. It does. It yeah. does work. And Eli's uh, actually actively engaging. He's saying, he said, I think what I am seeing from Eli, he said, is a low motivation starting to happen with fear and upheaval. So, so addressing using recognition to sort of, I think this kind of ties back to Zach also aligning mission. In my experience, the, the way you get rid of negativity and cynicism is not by saying we you can't do that anymore, not by reprimanding someone that's doing it. It's by doing it's overwhelming it with with this positive drive and this positive energy that you're doing great stuff, we're doing great stuff, and get out of our way, and people don't have time to, to fret and worry about uh, the negativity and the politics and all the other things that uh, take away from performance in the workplace. Well, we can't comment from you know the work crowd perspective on comp strategy, even though we've uh, had some exposure to it. A company's comp strategy is based on you know their geography, their budget, their pay grades, you know, various other things. But once you take compensation off as a variable that HR can affect, because uh, HR is only somewhat, in, uh, is, can only influence, you know, comp strategies to a certain extent because they're operating within, you know, sort of structures and, and rules. But once you get past that, then if you pivot to, again, some of the, the, the positioning that we like to take the clients is asking questions, well, do people, are people proud of the work they do each day? because that's an inherent human drive. Assuming that they're being paid fair enough and reasonable enough within it, then your next step is, well, do you think they find you know, meaning in the work that they do each day? Are they proud of the work that they do? And do they feel that the work contributes to the overall mission of the business? Then, it's, then you're really touching the human aspects that influence a person's decision that says, I'm coming to work today and I hate this job. And I hate the people work with, well, forget hate. I just don't like it. I don't care. No one appreciates me. No one notices me. What I do is not appreciated or meaningful. And the company I work with, I don't have any connection with. Well, they're already a, a foot and a half out the door. But recognition can help with keeping that away and more of a sentiment of people do notice me and my work is meaningful. And I can see the meaningful work that other people in the organization are doing that ties to the mission of the business. And so I'm proud of that. And thus, you know, we're saying, great, well, technology has a role to help you create those experiences. They can make it systematic. You know, you should be looking at the programs, whether you're working with us or you've got some other vendor, well, that's fine. But look at how the spend and the money and the strategy you know, is tying back to that question of does this strategy and approach and use of our resources make people proud of the work they do each day? And 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 do they in aggregate make them proud of the work of the business? Right. And if the answer is no, well then we'll say, great, repivot. You know, ask yourself those tough questions. Because if you can make people, you know, proud of their work and proud of the company, you're going to get the best from them, all other things being equal. I'll share one interesting experience and I'd counsel you all to do this. I took a flight the other day and, you know, poor airlines and hotels, they're copying it terribly as well too, both at a business level and all the poor employees who are having to, you know, be so close to customers because in a hospital situation, everybody's bedecked and fully, you know, gowned. But I'm traveling on American Airlines flight and there's 400 people on every flight, you know, fully packed and there's the staff that are there all day breathing and working, you know, with these tiny little flimsy, you know, masks where the sides open, you know, et cetera. But anyway, my point was, so the lady and the, 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 the flight crew, excuse me, at the end of the flight, you know, and I walked over and I said, oh, I just want to thank you so much for making us feel, you know, somewhat normal and being able to travel and be with, you know, kids on a family. And it's so, and oh my God, she was just came to life and the captain was behind her and I saw him, you know, sort of light up. So when you're out and about, particularly in these times, people are yearning for a bit of appreciation feedback, you know, say, you know, say thanks to them, you know, it's tough for all of us out there and particularly ones that are facing, you know, consumers and the public every day as part of their job, you know, they didn't sign up for that stuff. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Zach, I don't know if you want to have a close. I want to thank every healthcare worker in America who's on the front lines of this horrible plague. Uh, we do great work every day. We did great work every day before it. We'll do great work every day going forward. 
uh, we're finally getting some of the recognition that we're entitled to. But we as leaders have to keep it alive. That's my, my closing message here. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. All the best to you.